What's up, everyone? Welcome to the art. I think we have like multiple titles going on here, but we are going to be talking about the business of photography and, of course, making more money through self printing. So that's what we're going to talk about today. I am your host, Sal Sincata. If you've never uh, seen our channel or one of our videos before, where you've been, welcome. Welcome to the family. Welcome to the show. Buckle up because we have a ton of information coming your way. And so before we get started, everybody's in the chat. Let me know where you're from. My team is in the chat. We'll be taking questions the entire time if you're watching this broadcast live. Uh, if you're watching it on our YouTube channel, just jump into the comments. Uh, and if you have questions about anything we go over today, me and my team will be sure to answer them. Uh, but let's do an audio check. How's audio? We good? All right. It's always good and we have good audio. And where's everybody? Where's everybody from? Tell me. I'm gonna. I'm actually gonna cheat here since I still have my laptop. I'm gonna peek into the chat, see where you guys are all coming in from. Pennsylvania, Nashville, Chicago, Bama, Bama Maryland, Seattle, Fort Worth, Tampa. I thought I saw UK in here earlier before, and of course we had Iowa in the house. Um, so very cool. We've got a bunch of people from all over the place. Uh, really, really uh, exciting. I don't want to forget Louisiana. Little no, little Nola. Finland in the house. Yeah. How cool. Springfield, Missouri. Not cool. <laughs> I don't get excited about Springfield, Missouri, as I sit in O'Fallon, Illinois, close by to Springfield, Missouri. All right. Let's stop the chit chat, the jabbering. Let's get down to business today. If you're a photographer, of course. Um, in this economy, in every economy, it, it really is about finding new ways to stand out from the crowd and make more money. How do we do that? Uh, and that is an age old question that has been going on since I got started in this industry. And so my background, uh, I've been doing this for 15 years as a professional photographer. So no other job. Uh, I'm a photographer, do it full time, love it, super passionate about it. But hey, I want to make money. Uh, I'm assuming you guys want to make money too. So maybe you're on the cusp and you're thinking, well, I got a full-time job. Maybe I want to quit my job, any of those kinds of things. Or you're just, you are a full-time studio, but you're looking for additional ways to make money. Um, Self-printing to me is one of those ways. And that's the rabbit hole I'm going to take you down uh, today as we, as we go through this. So I thoroughly enjoy printing. Uh, we have multiple printers in our studio. I'll share all this stuff with you uh, as we go. But here's a quick overview of what we're going to cover today. Uh, I'm going to show you my studio. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time there. I know many of you watching have you know, seen our videos before and kind of know our background, but I do want to just show you, you know, what we do, our studio space, uh, who our clients are. Uh, we'll talk about in-person sales uh, a little bit here and how we implement the art of printing uh, for in-person you know, in sales. Like how do we, how do we merge self-printing, right? and merge that into the IPS process. And there, there's a way, there's things you can do that are gonna help you stand out and make more money. Uh, we'll talk about, you know, do you work with a traditional lab or self-printing only? Is it either or? Do you have to do everything yourself or work with a lab? We'll kind of talk about that and what we do. Uh, the pros of self-printing, uh, self isn't that funny? It's like a, uh, like a Freudian slip. I saw the word below pitfalls and I was like this, the pros of self-pity is, <laughs> is where I went. I don't know why. Uh, I don't think there's, maybe there are pros to self-pity. You feel better about yourself. I don't know, because you just pity. Um, anyway, uh, pitfalls to avoid to get the best results when printing. How to use Lightroom to print. We'll show you the process. Uh, different paper types. So I'll show you uh, two uh, of the paper types that we use, and I'll talk about why we use them. Uh, how to present and deliver this to clients and vendors. So I am gonna show you a couple of different products we have here. Uh, if we can cut to the other camera. Um, you've probably seen this top-down view before. We can cut to the other camera. Um, still can't cut to it. There we go. Uh, so you're seeing just kind of the tools of the trade, and I'll show you some different ways of delivering it. Uh, even things like this. Uh, these products is how we, you know, kind of display uh, prints. So you're seeing them displayed on, oop, this way, displayed on the shelf behind me, uh, and I'll show you how to do that as well. And so I'll tell you where we get all these products uh, too and whatever tools you need to get started. So it's not as complicated as you think. A lot of people think when it comes to printing, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's complicated, it's overwhelming, but I think it's like everything else in life. Um, you're always overwhelmed by what you don't know, right? And then once you do it, you're like, ah, oh, that's, that's not so bad. Uh, don't forget, if you do have questions as we go, my team is in the chat and they'll take those questions once we dig into this. Here's the mantra for today. Nobody cares 
work harder. All right, let's get going. What'd you say? All it says because of your jacket says body care. Just body care? <laughs> Not nobody cares, body care. It's like self, um, what do they call that? Like when you, like you need self? Self-help? No, not self-help. We all need a little self-help. bit of self-help. You know what I'm saying? Self-love? Self-care? No, self-care. That was the word I was looking for. So body care, work harder. I guess we can do all sorts of things here. Body, okay, I need to focus. As you can tell, my team is a distraction. All right, our studio, just so you guys know, you're looking at our building. We're actually broadcasting uh, right from the first floor uh, on the right-hand side of this picture. That's where I'm sitting right now. Uh, we are a seven-figure wedding and portrait studio based in O'Fallon, Illinois. Uh, we are not in some huge metropolitan area like a New York, a Chicago, L.A. We're, I don't want to say we're in the sticks. We're not fully in the sticks. Uh, we are, but we're, we're close. It's cornfield out here, right? So I just, as I teach you things and I tell you things, I, I always hear photographers, you know, say things like, well, you don't understand. There's nobody in my market. Like, guys your market's big enough, right? Unless you're truly, truly like in some rural town with like population of a thousand, right? But this isn't some monster town. So you can make money in photography uh, if, you, if you get your stuff together, right? Uh, so we've been doing this 15 years now. And so I do understand custom, you know, I, we understand customers. We know the type of customers uh, that we're dealing with, both ones with money and, and kind of on the lower end. Uh, we understand what you're going through. We understand starting your business in your basement. That's where I started. We understand growing pains, right? So I've been through it all. When we started this company, I started in my basement, slowly worked to my living room. So I guess in the beginning, it was just still a hobby. Uh, and uh, my significant other at the time was not going to allow me to bring it into the house. So I was serious about it. Um, that's not true. I'm making things up. But it started in the basement. Then we made it to the living room. And then we realized we needed a studio space and then ultimately the building that you're seeing in that picture. Check out our website if you want to see a little bit of my work, salsincata.com. And ultimately, I guess, as we get going here, know that we love the process of creation, right? From concept to final delivery, I really do believe we have the coolest jobs in the world as photographers. Um, you know, there's, it, it, the creation process is fun. Uh, and I think, you know, I never thought I was going to be that guy. Like, you know, back when I started, you know, we've all had those conversations with those photographers. Like, you know, I worked with film and you had to work the chemicals through your bladder. I, I don't know why I said that, but it just feels like those are the stories that you hear. So my point is in all this is that we've been down this path, been down this road. We've been down the struggle. Um, and still, I wouldn't trade it for the world. We, we really do have cool jobs. Inside the studio, here's a current picture of our uh, preview room. Uh, this was taken literally two minutes before go live because I forgot to put it in my presentation. So this is a current snapshot. Uh, if you've seen anything in the past, it, it doesn't necessarily look like this. Uh, so there's definitely been upgrades to images on the wall, um, you know, products on shelves, and, uh, and you could see, you know, that's kind of what clients are gonna walk into for our preview. And I think it's very important that you get away from this model of digital only. And I, I, think, I think most photographers you know, have figured out that digital only as a delivery mechanism is just disastrous to your business. You don't really have a business, right? If you're shooting and burning, um, it's just a tough place to be. And, that, and there's usually a multitude of reasons, I don't wanna cover it, uh, why you're doing that. But if you are doing that, you've gotta make the move into what is known as IPS, right? In-person sales, uh, I think is something very important. And I didn't always have a space, you know, if we go back to this picture that looked like this, right? When I started out, you know, you can look at something like this and go, you know, preview room goals, if you will, right? I didn't always have something that looked this polished with all these different pictures on the wall, different products on the wall. Uh, you know, we, we, had to, we had to build towards it. And, and that's okay. We're all at different places in our career. You're going to build to this. But you've got to, if you want to make money in this industry, the average photographer plus or minus a couple of grand, is making, it averages about $40,000, top line. That's not a lot of money, guys, uh, especially when you consider all the expenses and liabilities you have on top of that, right? I mean, 40 grand, if we're being honest, how many of you have spent that much on gear in the last two years, right? So things are expensive for our craft, but yet we're not charging 
uh, accordingly. Now, you know, we'll do a future video on like pricing and packaging. I'm sure you guys want to see stuff like that. But just keep that in the back of your mind as we're going through this. If you want to have your own space one day, if you want to have a nicer preview room with product on the wall, and you got to charge for that. And you can only charge so much for digital only delivery. And that's a little bit about what we're talking about today, which is how do we value print uh, in our day to day? And so high level IPS, um, this is not a presentation on IPS, okay? But the basics are by, by engaging in IPS, in-person sales, you are placing value on the printed product. And I think you have to have that. You have to place value on the pro final product because in today's day, day and age, clients believe that everything should be digital. And you can't sustain a business or a life for that matter, or ever retire someday, if you're just strictly operating on, I'm gonna shoot, I'm gonna deliver you some digital files. Just the time, forget the cost of equipment, right? Just the time involved in doing that is enough to put you out of business. It, it, and how many of you, you don't have to be, uh, tell, maybe tell me in the chat, I wanna hear it. How many of you are behind? Behind on editing, behind on client deliveries, right? Because everything, did you raise your hand? My wife raised her hand. That's how, well, you're kind of defeating the example I'm trying to set for everybody. And Alyssa, I got a message for you. Nobody cares, body cares. Nobody cares, work harder, um, right? We, we all get behind. And so we've got to have enough money to increase staff, inc increase um, resources, things like that. So we, we need that money and we've got to value print uh, for that matter. So let's keep going. Um, no digital only options. That is not an option in our studio. Now I, I, I say that with an asterisk, right? If, if we are working with um, commercial clients, well, that is what they're hiring for us for, but I'm also charging them a premium for that, right? I, I'm, I'm not doing commercial work for $199 mini set, $19.99 mini session, pick five digitals. Like, what are you guys thinking about? Like, it's, it's unsustainable. Uh, from that from that perspective. So no digital only options. Yes, we deliver digital files. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying, but it's part of a larger package. And that's that's the part in your business you've, you've got to adjust. Will you lose clients? Maybe, I don't, I don't know. I haven't lost clients. The client who wants to spend $29 in our studio and get a mini session in digital files, I would make the argument that's not my client. That's not somebody I want to work with at all. Um, I want the client who is going to value um, products that I offer, whether it's albums, whether it's prints. So instead of worrying about what clients you will lose, maybe a better way to think about moving into IPS or print in general is what type of clients will you attract? I think that's a much better question to ask, a much more pointed question to ask as you try to make more money in photography. And so that starts leading us down to questions of, do we go with a traditional lab? Is this an either or proposition? And it is by no means an either or proposition. There is zero scenario that on this printer or any printer that I'm gonna have at my level, I'm printing acrylics or canvas and you know framing the canvas and all that other nonsense. I want no part of that, right? That's, we're going to our partner. Our partner on that is H&H Color Lab, which is where we send a majority of our print work. I, I want it. I wanna say all of our print work, right? I'm sure there's one-off pieces we might order someplace else or some we might print, but H&H Color Lab is our partner there, right? So this is not an either or, it's a more of a blended thing. Metals, I'm not, you, do you even know how to make metals? Have you ever seen the process for, for metals? Like dye sublimation, like all that shit? I'm not doing that, right? So you've gotta understand, this is, I'm using self-printing as a way of elevating my studio into more of a fine art kind of position for my clients, right? It's that, it's that next elevated thing, and, and we'll talk about that. That's what's gotta be in the back of your head. How do you attract that, that higher end client who is not looking for pictures from Walmart for you know $2 for an eight by 10? That's not my client, that should not be your client. And so to me, it's, it's really about the messaging of delivering fine art, handmade products to, to our clients uh, and positioning it that way, that this is handmade, fine art, uh, the entire process has been controlled, right? You have to educate them on that uh, a little bit. So it's about standing out. I've always found that different is what stands out. 
I definitely don't do it to save money, although self-printing, we'll talk about this in a second, is significantly cheaper than going to a lab. But I'm not looking to sit here and print eight by tens, right? Uh, you know, like if, if like doing a volume job or like eight by tens, you know, the printer I have next to me is a Canon Pro 1000, uh, this guy. This is my printer. This isn't something that I'm just like doing because like, oh, I, I gotta do a webinar and stuff like that. This sits right next to my desk upstairs um, and we use it. What I'm not gonna do is print eight by tens. Oh, the client got four eight by tens, two 11 by 16s. I'm not doing all that shit. Now, back in the day, there were a lot of studios and still to this day that do all their printing on maybe not this printer, larger Canon printers, like their 4000 series, but that's not what I wanna do. That to me, that's not the love of the craft. That's not, that's not that passion project, if you will, right? So uh, I'm using it in a, in a little bit different way and that's what I'm sharing with you guys today. So I don't do it to save money. I really wanna own my art from beginning to end. Again, the goal is not to print everything. Uh, the goal is to be very selective in what you're delivering to your client and communicating that to your client. So as we get down to it, why, why print, right? Um, well, I wanna, it, the art of it, if you will. You know, I know as a photographer, I'm an artist, I'm a creative. Uh, I'm involved in talking to the client, conceptualizing with the client, we stylize for the client, lighting the shoot, editing the pictures. Take that extra step. I've always found that even in the height of like shoot and burn, I always found like this empty feeling at the end of it, even for myself, right? How many pictures, I'll share a true story with you. Um, Alyssa and I, we just had our, our home uh, remodeled, our first floor. And one of the things we wanna do is um, put up prints from all our travels around the world, right? So as photographers, we all get to do a little travel. If you don't, it's it's underrated. You need to you need to do more travel. It's incredible. So now we've got pictures in New York City, Chicago, Europe, whatever. Well, I want those pictures in my house. I don't want to put pictures uh, that I bought from right somebody else. It's like the saying, right? The shoemaker's kids has have no shoes, and so the, the photographer has no pictures on the wall. And that's basically what we have. So I went and got a hard drive and we're going through our hard drives and all our travel pictures. And what am I putting on the walls? Fi large format um, fine art prints. That's what's gonna go on the wall with fine art paper, framed. Uh, I'm talking four to five foot tall prints. That's what I want on our walls, right? So I found that in going through this exercise, I, what, we must have gone through like 12 to 13 years of hard drives and I'm like, I totally forgot I took this picture. I totally forgot I was here in this city. I totally forgot. All of us are guilty of that. Now think about our clients. Like you've got all these digital files. They're sitting on a hard drive that's gonna crash one day. Nothing's on your walls. That's a tragedy to me, right? Is it a tragedy or travesty? Which is it? Can it be a tragedy and tra travesty? Travesty, travesty, travesty. Doesn't sound right. Somebody Google it, look it up, tragedy. We're creatives, we're not English majors. All right, it's a tragedy. And so I think there's something extremely therapeutic about crafting the image, editing the image, and then printing the image. Do we, do we have a ruling from the tragedy. judges? Tragedy. Tragedy is the ruling tragedy. from the judges. What's travesty? Is a false you didn't know when you were watching today, we were gonna cover some English. It's a little bit of everything here with the Sincatas. What is it? A, f a travesty is a false or absurd or distorted representation. Or distorted representation. So in your context, it's a tragedy. Yeah. It's tragic that we don't have that. I don't think I can really think of a sentence where I can say travesty. Here, I've got one for you. You got one? The Give us a sample sentence. The absurdly lenient sentence is a travesty of justice. The absurdly lenient sentence is a travesty of justice. I'm going to save that. I'm going to put that right there. We'll use it someday. <laughs> All right, anyway, um, I think self-printing is not something everyone does. It uh, doesn't matter why. It could be because of they think it's too expensive, they think it's too hard. Um, and so I think by default, that's what makes it unique, which to me always translates for money, right? We present, we on our end, we present this to our clients as artisan quality, right? And we're letting them know, hey, we own the process from shoot to final delivery. I think if you want your clients to buy into this, 
it's not just about like taking the print that comes off the printer and signing your name to it. That's stupid. Um, not that having a signature is stupid. I, I just think that comes across the wrong way, right? I think you have to explain to them like, hey, not only are we gonna you know, edit this, we're gonna make sure it prints perfect, that your skin tones are perfect, that the paper is perfect. And I'm selecting a special paper because of the way I shot this. Like clients, high-end clients love that shit. Um, and so you need to realize that, that, that they love that experience. How hard is it? I always feel like simple is just too dismissive of it, but it really is simple. And so we're gonna print one right now and I'm gonna show you what it, what it takes to print. We're just gonna have one come off the printer uh, and we'll talk about that process. But the learning curve in all this is just getting it set up. Like, and if you are computer literate, even like in the, the simplest of sense, you understand that once you install software, drivers get installed and that's it. So when you go to install the software for your printer that you're, you buy, the drivers are gonna get installed and then you're just selecting what printer to print to, just like you do in your, your home business laser printer, what pr printer to print to. And in this case, you're just gonna add paper type. That's the difference here. It's not that, it's not really no, not that much difference. Now, back in the day, you needed special RIP software, they called it. And this software alone was like, could be almost $2,000 uh, for the software, right? And it was this thing that like, took from your Photoshop and then had to rasterize shit and then get it to the printer and speak printer language and convert colors. Those, those days are gone. Like maybe the big labs use that, but not for us on the desktop. Desktop printing at this point is super easy. And Lightroom makes it 10 times easier uh, for, for the photographer. So you already own it. Many of you are working out of Lightroom um, or Photoshop and it's semi built in, but Lightroom is the tool, right? So printer drivers, that's just telling your computer what printer to use. Well, I'm gonna print to Canon. And then the only thing that gets somewhat, you know, like, huh, what do I need to do is what paper type you're using, right? So here behind me, I've got a uh, fine art smooth and a semi-gloss paper. And I'm gonna show you what the two of those look like. I'm a, I, I don't like shine on prints. I really like matte finish uh, because of the way it handles glare, things like that. But some people like gloss, semi-gloss, metallic, there, there's, endless amount of paper types that are, that are out there. You know, you're gonna pick what you like. I'm gonna to talk to you about a few uh, that Canon offers that we use. Uh, but basically in its most simplistic form, that's all there is to it. It's not that complicated. Uh, so what I wanna do now, uh, I'll show you there's two printers we use, well, there's three in our studio that we use, but two that are, I think, consumer grade. Uh, the Pro 300 is, uh, prints 13 inches by up to 39 images, uh, 39 inches, and it's perfect for your desktop, right? So it's a, it's a small form factor, uh, it's under $1,000. I mean, we're not talking about a lot of money here. I don't have links for you. I'm not getting kickback on this from you. I'm just sharing with you, you know, go to your favorite place and buy it uh, if it's what you're interested in. But it's, it's at $899, it's, it's pretty economical, and it will pay for itself almost immediately because I'm gonna share with you how to make money with this. Small footprint, perfect for desktops. The, the big guy here, the Pro 1000, that's what's right here. We can't even fit the whole thing in the frame, but it's uh, prints 17 inches uh, by 22 inches. And so a decent size, right? So for those of you who print 16 by 20, that's coming right off this, this guy. You don't need anything else, right? Um, just over four minutes to print a full sheet. We'll, we'll print here. Replaceable print head. This is also important. I know it's not something you're thinking about right now if you're just getting into printing, but it is something, every printer has a duty cycle, right? And what's gonna end up happening is that that print head is gonna die, it's gonna clog, something like that. Many printer manufacturers, when that happens, you have to replace the entire printer. You can't just replace the printer head. And so Canon has always done an incredible job with this. So on the Pro 1000, Pro 300, uh, you can uh, just replace the printer head and go from there. So. It's a little bit more money, $12.99, but I think the features are well worth it. This workhorse has been sitting by my desk for years, uh, and it's, it's still my original printer. I still use it, uh, but it sits next to my desk upstairs um, on a little side table. So let's do this. Let's go over into Lightroom. And so here's a recent photo shoot uh, from when I was in Italy. And this is the uh, interface you're used to in Lightroom, right? So you just kind of, you know, you're seeing what pictures uh, that you got, that you took, right? We've got some beautiful pictures here from Venice. Absolutely stunning. I, I think 
Alyssa, I don't know how you feel, but one of my favorite models that we've uh, ever worked with. She's absolutely naturally, stunningly beautiful. Uh, I would work with her anywhere. Again, um, so let's print this, right? So this is what I'm trying to explain to you. The, when you install the print drivers, right? So you're gonna get your printer, you're either gonna get, uh, download the software or get a, a DVD drive, which I don't, a DVD, which I don't think anybody has DVD drives anymore. Um, at least if you're on a Mac, you don't. But regardless, download the software, you install it. It installs all the drivers for you. So your computer's gonna know that there's a printer. When you're in Lightroom, even if you're in Lightroom right now and don't have a printer hooked up, it's as simple as hitting Command, right, P. And this is the screen you're gonna pop into, which is his print module you can see here in the top right. I think if you're on a uh, um, PC, it's Control, right? It's always Command or Control P, I think is what it is. But you're gonna end up in this print module right up here. Now what I've done on the left-hand side, um, not sure if you can see it, but on the left-hand side, I've created user templates because I know I print certain sizes. So this is what makes it even easier. You're gonna know what paper you're using. You're gonna know what size paper you're using. And you're just gonna set this up as a preset. So for me, we are gonna do the uh, Canon Fine Art Smooth 17 by 22 paper, right? But I want a square print. So I'm gonna print it square uh, on that ratio. Now, it, it really is this easy. I, 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 I said it in my slide, like saying it's easy, it's, it's simple is like, it just feels like it's, that's the wrong answer, but it, it really is. So now here, look, I don't want it to print horizontal. I think we're gonna go with the square print. So now I just say zoom to fill here. This is, these are Lightroom features. These are, has nothing to do with your printer at this point. Um, and now, you know, you can move this around, right? For, because it's a square print. Um, so we can kind of, you know, in a horizontal image. So we can go with her a little off center, right? I don't want her all the way here in the corner. That feels about right, okay? For those of you watching at home, screaming at your computer, yelling at me to move it more left, I don't care what you have to say. This is where I'm printing it. Um, now, as you scroll down on the right, you do have some options. You have cell size option. This is all standard stuff. This has nothing to do with your printer. This is just setting up, right, how far edge to edge you're printing, your rulers, your margins. Once you set this up, you basically save it as a template and you're done. You come in here just like I did and I say, I'm printing a square print and that's what I'm doing. Now. This I will spend a few seconds on here. Something you may, not, may or may not realize is that when you're working with a J, JPEG file, those are what's known as 8-bit images. And what I do not want to get into uh, in this, because it has nothing to do, well, maybe a little bit to do with the printer, but it has nothing to do with the overall pitch, is just understanding that there is a difference in color depth between 8-bit and 16-bit. Most cameras, um, I believe only medium format cameras, I, I could be wrong here, uh, but like phase one, those are si true 16-bit capture. Uh, so they're capturing 16-bit of color, right? And it's like, I don't know how many million, 16 million, billion, trillion colors, but there's a color gamut there, there's a color space, and it's capturing that color. Now, you might think, well, that's not really a big deal. Well, you ever look at your images sometimes on your computer and you're seeing banding like when it's just a blue sky and you see that banding that's happening, that's why it's happening. That's, that's color depth. Your monitor, your printer doesn't know how to display the gradation of colors. 16-bit cameras, when I've, when I've used a, like a medium format phase one uh, and taken a picture with a blue sky, no, there, there's no pixelation, right? There's no banding that's happening because of that color depth, right? So. If you shoot though your cameras, and I don't wanna screw this up because I'm not up to speed on the R5, and, but mostly camera, I, uh, most of the cameras from Canon, the higher end ones, I believe are 14 bit color. Not 100% sure, I know things have changed. So it's still not quite 16 bit, but it's also better than 8 bit. So now you shoot 14 bit color, raw images, right? And then you save as a JPEG. You've just lost that color data through compression. And when it compresses, What's going to end up happening is your, your computer is basically in the software is going, all right, well, these blues, I don't have a color match for. What should I do? And, it, and, and the software, I'm, I'm simplifying things. The software is just basically going to say, well, they're close enough. Make them this color, blue, right? And so that's what ends up happening. So you lose a little bit of that color detail. Now, if it's for Instagram, uh, Facebook, doesn't fucking matter, right? But if it's for printing, 
it does matter. So a lot of times what I will do as part of a workflow, again, I don't, I don't wanna overcomplicate this or overwhelm you. You don't have to know this. I'm just kinda, for my geeks out there, I'm just sharing a little bit of info. If you shoot uh, raw, what we tend to do is a picture we know we're gonna do something with, we will edit it as a TIFF file versus um, a PSD or saving it as a PSD. We will save it as a TIFF file because TIFF files can handle that 16-bit color depth. Bring that TIFF file into Lightroom, all of that to explain to you under my picture, if you can hide me here, Alyssa. Oh no, I see it. Right here, you see 16-bit output. So if you were working with a TIFF file, you would select this, right? You want as much color output as possible uh, from, you, from your images. So that's what that's all about. That was a very long-winded answer. I apologize. I hope that makes sense. It, it's not something you have to worry about. If it's JPEG image you're printing, it's 8-bit. You don't have to worry about it, okay? Um, so color management, we're going to let the printer manage that. We don't want Lightroom managing it. We want the printer managing it because the printer is going to manage that to the paper type. So hopefully this is all making sense. And if you have questions, please ask. Any questions yet? yet. Comments, suggestions? Is this boring you guys? You loving it? You eating it alive? Or are you just like, digital only, Sal? <laughs> so now we just, I'm gonna show you a couple of things here. This is how simple it is. You're gonna look, we're gonna look at print settings. This is the only thing you have to change and set up. You come into your, you see it says printer, Canon Pro 1000, and you're gonna go to quality and media, and we are printing on Canon's premium fine art smooth paper, right? I want the highest print quality. A lot of you guys will do standard or um, high. I don't care if it takes longer to print. I want as much print quality as possible here. So I always select uh, the highest. And uh, that, those are the two things you, you got to switch here. Okay. And then from there, you're hitting print. I'm just going to hit print and let this come out. If you got questions, please hit me. Good question, coming. How about calibration of monitor and printer? So, great question, let me get this printing. So what's gonna happen is, when I hit print, uh, I'm using the manual tray, which is in the back, okay? So I just load one sheet of paper in there at a time. Uh, and then what happens is the printer just pops up, you can't see the screen, but it says, hey, um, we've got a request from your computer, are you ready to print? So that's your cue to kind of put a piece of paper in there. Uh, and then hit okay. And now it's gonna take that information and it's gonna start printing. In about four minutes, that print will come out. We'll look at it then. So we do have a question. The question is um, just around uh, cal monitor calibration uh, and paper calibration. So the first thing is, and I would say this whether you are self printing or you're sending it to a lab. The, the computer screen that you have received from Apple or Dell or Sony, it doesn't matter who you're using, is the worst possible thing you could use to judge what your image looks like. The, it is the absolute worst. Um, there's nothing to argue about. If you wanna argue about it, that just signals to me you don't know what you're talking about. So, shh. Because Mac monitors are notoriously blue. So if you edit to your Mac monitor, you're gonna warm something up, and then when it comes back from the lab, right, it's not gonna look the same. If it does look the way you want it to look, you know why that is? Because whether you realize it or not, your lab is actually color calibrating for you when they get the image, which by the way, almost all labs do. So this is a side conversation. When we send something to print, because all our monitors are calibrated, when we send something to the lab, we check the box that says, do not color correct my image. Um, because I know that it's been color calibrated to true reds and skin tones and all that other stuff. When you print on metal, when you print on canvas, when you print on fine art paper, things print differently based on the substrate. So for example, metal tends to be a lot more contrasty. The blacks tend to be a lot darker. Have you ever gotten a metal print back and you're like, this looks, this looks different than it did on my monitor? That's why. So it's very important to calibrate your monitor and then use the correct paper profile. Right now, granted, when you send it to a lab, you don't know what paper, and they're not gonna give you their profiles, right? Um, anybody who's been doing this for any amount of time, you're gonna remember the days of when you would open up an account at an H&H &H Color Lab, they wouldn't start accepting your work 
until you went through a calibration process. You would have to send your 8x10. Some, some of the labs had software that you would have to use. They would send it to you. They'd send your color chart back. You had to match them up, make sure everything looked right. Green light, go. Because that, that's what it used to be like, if you, if you remember. So now, at a minimum, you should be color, color calibrating your monitor. Here, I think. Hold on. Ah, it's at my desk. So in my bag, I actually have a monitor calibration tool that we use uh, from Data Color because I have to make sure my monitor is calibrated. Then from there, you can even calibrate in the field when you're shooting to your monitor and then to the paper type so that the red you're seeing on your screen, the blue you're seeing on your screen matches the blue on, on the paper. Now that's for those of us who are extremely, I'm not gonna say the word, but we are OCD when it comes to this. Um, that was a nice word. That was like a politically correct word, you know? I'm just trying to be, I'm just trying to be family friendly. You know what I mean? Like I'm turning over a new leaf this year, 2023. I don't think it's gonna last past January, but there'll be a few F-bombs dropped, yeah. So anyway, that's the, that's the kind of stuff. You're seeing the print come out here uh, just as we're talking, right? And that's how I do it at, when I'm actually printing too. I'll just send it to print and then I'm checking email, I'm doing whatever else I gotta do, walk away, come back. So that was, that was a really good question. Hopefully that answer makes sense. Yeah, hit me with more questions. When printing, is your computer connected to the printer via wireless or USB cable? Yeah, so the question is, when printing, is my computer connected to the printer via, via wireless or USB cable? So we are using a USB cable. I can't pull it up for you, uh, but it's plugged into the side of my computer uh, into the uh, laptop. Even the, the big dog we have upstairs, we have the Pro 4000, um, I have, um, I have to go over there and plug into it to do it. You can do wireless. Um, it just takes a lot longer because some of these files are huge. Uh, and so it just takes a little bit longer. Uh, and I, I don't mean this as a dig. I just always have connection problems when I'm working on wireless with these printers. So uh, I've just kind of given up on it. But yeah, we're, we're tethered for sure. Um, what else we got? So the question is uh, just for me to elaborate a little bit more on some RIP software versus Lightroom, uh, if I'm aware of any. I am not, so I don't want to misguide you there. I have found Lightroom to be very, very robust. Um, now, I say that in it's robust for my needs. So for those of you watching, you might be thinking like, well, is there really a difference? There is. There is RIP software in and of itself can be very, very functional, right? So for the most part, RIP software does a lot of stuff, but one of the things it does really well is let's say you've got this massive job um, and you wanna maximize you know, the amount of real estate on a sheet of paper, right? What RIP software is gonna do is basically lay out wallets and eight by tens and five by sevens and just maximize uh, your, your print order. And then you can do things like, and some of this you can still do in Lightroom but you can do things in RIP software. Like you basically are setting up like print pro product packages, send it there and it'll print like school and sports guys, things like that. So I, I, I can't tell you any software because I have no firsthand knowledge and I never want to uh, misguide you guys. Any other questions? Um, somebody asked you to clarify, do you calibrate your monitor to the printer colors? You just said match the red on the screen to the printer. Um, so the question is, uh, is asking me for clarification on uh, the calibration process. So. I calibrate my monitor, right? That's, to me, that's master. You, you will use what's known, let's pull it up here, as a paper profile. Uh, let's go here, nope. So each paper type, see these here, media types? These are basically profiles. These profiles are converting what it is telling the printer based on what it sees on the monitor, based on the paper type, make, here's how you print. So this, these profiles are basically your calibration. Now, I will tell you, again, if you wanna dig into it, you can create your own profiles for every single piece of paper. You can do that. I've tried it. 
the, the, the difference is negligible, right? In some instances, it may be. So what do I mean by that? You would print a sheet of paper that looks like a color grid, right? Like red, green, blue, black, gray. And then there's a tool you can use. Um, I want to say like a spectrometer, but that is definitely, I, I don't know if that's what it calls. It just sounds right, like the, the, the gigawatts of the spectrometer. But there's this tool that you use and you scan the red cell, you scan the blue cell, you scan the yellow cell, you scan the white cell, and then it creates a paper profile specific. The thing is you don't need to do that. Canon, Hannah Mule, uh, and on and on down the paper manufacturers, they've done that scanning for you, right? And so you don't have to do that. These become your profiles. So if you calibrate your monitor, you're gonna be 98% of the way there. Now, I say all that, but then there's still a time where you might need to adjust, right? So for example, on the bottom right hand uh, side here, right above my picture, you see where it says print adjustment, brightness and contrast? Now mine are both at zero, because this is gonna come out damn close to what's on my monitor. I know this because I've been doing this process uh, for a very long time. This is gonna look pretty damn close to what's on my monitor. Maybe not your monitor, right? You understand what's going on? Your monitor's not calibrated. Um, but this thing's gonna look pretty damn close to what's on my monitor. But let's just say it wasn't. Let's say it was printing a little bit darker. I would not go adjust the image in your typical Lightroom uh, process. Oh my God, that is breathtaking, right? This is on Canon fine art paper. Um, it's fine art smooth. I love the way the blacks look. Uh, it doesn't do it justice seeing it on a video broadcast. I'm just telling you, this is, I get giddy when I see this stuff. Uh, but I'm gonna show you how, we, how we're gonna mount this. But this looks pretty damn close to what's on my uh, monitor. Now, we'll get into this in a second, right? So, okay. So this piece on here, we could make micro adjustments, right, by adjusting brightness or contrast. Um, and in the, sometimes I've had to do that with a, a different paper type or something like that. I might need to make the image like just five ticks brighter or add a little bit of extra contrast to get it to have that punch, but that's it. So calibrate your monitor, long answer. Yeah, one more question, if there's any. The question is, is if you're sending to a pro lab, should you send TIFF files? Uh, your pro lab will murder you and then they will find out where you found, heard this and then they will come track me down. Uh, no, most pro labs are not accepting TIFF files. So you're gonna work through their software. Uh, most of those software is JPEG only, right? And you gotta remember a TIFF file. I mean, I've had some TIFF files that are one gig in size or 500 meg in size. You're not uploading a 500 meg file. So no, you're gonna send your lab um, in a, that 8-bit file, because that's what they're printing, right? They're gonna print that JPEG. It's more of a editing workflow. Like, so when you're editing, think about it this way. When you're editing, you wanna edit with as much data as possible, which is why you shoot raw. You don't shoot JPEG. Look at me. Are you shooting JPEG? Stop watching, hit stop, unsubscribe from our channel, just leave. You should not be shooting JPEG. Um, I'm just kidding about the unsubscribe, but definitely stop shooting JPEG. What's wrong with you? Um, so you're shooting raw, so you have all this data, okay? Now, of course, you've edited with all this data, you've recovered highlights, you've lifted shadows, whatever the case may be, because all that de detail, image detail is there. And now you go to compress it and save it as a JPEG, right? What I wouldn't wanna do is edit the JPEG and then recompress, if that makes sense, right? So editing, in as much detail as you can is a best practice and that should be your workflow. So hopefully that makes sense, but no, don't send the lab uh, a GIF. Okay, uh, yeah, a, a TIFF, a GIF, a TIFF, in a Jiffy, Jiffy TIFFs. All right, what I'm gonna do is go over to the other table right now and I'm gonna kind of show you this in different paper types and uh, we'll see, I'll show you how we can mount this and start having some fun. Just gotta get out of this booby trap that I'm stuck behind. Okay, so here's this print uh, right here uh, that you're seeing now. And this is on matte paper. So gir girls, or Alyssa, I'm relying on you. So you notice you're not seeing any reflective nature of this. This is uh, just fine art paper, absolutely beautiful. 
Um, and then here you can see, I printed this uh, just before we went on air. You see that this is a semi-gloss. So this is a nice Canon uh, photo paper, semi-gloss. And I'm assuming you can see some of that reflective. Uh, how is that supposed to be a transfer to the rest of You're seeing it or no? Yeah. Right. Uh, and then there's the, here's the same print printed on the Canon fine art paper. Uh, and you're seeing there's just, you know, it, it, it's a much deeper looking uh, print. I find it to have a little bit more depth. It looks good in frames. It looks good unframed. Uh, and one of the, you know, one of the trends in our industry right now, all the labs are offering it, is, is it's this deep matte uh, paper. Well, the deep matte is, is the same thing. It's not going to have any of this sheen uh, to it, right? And I don't know. I like it. So uh, it's really a preference thing. So the, this ends up becoming uh, some of my, my favorite stuff. So, okay, great. You print it. You can put it in a frame, <coughs> right? Uh, that's definitely something you can do. Put this over here. Um, and so, but what I like to do is I like to mount these. Um, they're they're going to they're gonna last uh, longer, and they're going to allow me to kind of display this uh, the way I like. So these are the mats. Uh, we get them from Pacific Mount. I'll put their link up uh, on the page. And we mount it to this paper, right, with sticky. And uh, so we'll do that here, right? So you would take this. Uh, and then, right, you can start trimming this uh, by hand. So you're going to have an X-Acto knife. And then, honestly, this is your kind of cold press uh, that you're going to work with here on my right. And I'll pull this to the middle when we get to that point. Let me get this off here uh, as well. Any questions while I'm doing this? Yeah, you can, um, you know, the, the further, so the question is, any reason to use 240 pixels? Um, the closer you're going to be to the image, the more pixels you need, right? That's why when you see uh, stuff on like billboards in New York City, uh, I don't know if any of you have ever done like big billboard work. Uh, but when we're doing billboard work for clients and stuff like that, typically uh, we're submitting images at 72 DPI, right? 72 or 96 uh, sometimes. Uh, your, web, your web page is typically at 72 because you're looking at it from so far away, the pixels can actually be larger per inch or less pixels per inch. Uh, that's why. So we're typically printing this at 240. Um, and that's going to give you, because we're going to be much, we're going to be viewing this much closer right, versus being seven, you know, 700 feet away or 70 feet away on some giant billboard. But I like where everybody's head's at. These are good questions. Does print quality use more ink? Yeah, of course. Does print quality use more ink? Yes. Uh, it's going uh, to take longer to print. Uh, it's going to, I mean, I can't, I'm not, I'm not canon. I can't sit here and tell you, like, it's going to use 30 droplets less or more. Uh, but in my experience, I have found that when I'm printing higher quality, I tend to replace ink cartridges. So my wallet says yes. I don't care what anybody else says. Keep going. Uh, so the question is, what do I tell my clients to keep pictures like this from fading? Uh, I find that pictures like this fade uh, over five years. Yeah, so when we deliver these to clients, one, we give them a lifetime warranty. I've been doing this 15 years. Uh, I've only had to replace one print, uh, and that's because they dropped it in a puddle. So there's that, and I still warrantied it. Um, we tell them, do not place it in direct sunlight. Um, if they're going to frame it, put it behind UV glass. Uh, to, to increase longevity. Uh, I have not seen the five-year number in my personal experience. That doesn't mean it's not true. Uh, it just means I've not personally uh, seen it uh, there. So I'd be curious, you know, what the clients are doing, you know. And there's all sorts of regional issues uh, that you're going to deal with as well, right? Like if somebody lives in a very humid climate, uh, or, you know, or a very dry climate. I mean, the things are going to age and wear differently. But I would definitely keep it out of direct sunlight. Um, I would say that even if it were a chemical print, right? I mean, just you don't put it in uh, direct sunlight. But I, I've not seen that experience of the five-year mark. All right, so I'm getting to cutting and mountain. My wife's yelling at me. What'd you say? You got 10 minutes. I got 10 minutes. Hey, we're fine, man. 
So this is the part I'm telling you guys that I find to be incredibly uh, therapeutic here, right? So I've got uh, upstairs next to my desk, uh, I've got a nice print area with this kind of mat up there and I don't get to spend enough time uh, doing it if you ask me, right? So what I'm looking to do now is make sure that there's overlap because I've got to trim this, okay? So, and I want it to be as straight as possible, right? So I'm gonna come right about here I'm just going to go over here gently. And then what you're going to do is we're going to put this in the press, peel this over, and then start peeling this back, right? So we're going to kind of start turn this handle. I don't know if you can see my handle. Okay, so we're going to start turning that. And then once that gets some traction, pull this back a little bit. Um, now my wife's asking questions. Um, she wants to know, is there a reason I don't just rip this all off? I guess, you know what happened to me one time? I ripped this whole thing off and then the print fell, stuck, and there was a giant air bubble in it. So now, and then I had to start all over. So now I just go nice and slowly. Okay, so now that's been pulled off. Now what we're gonna do, this is the part that I always find fun, um, is we're just gonna kind of exacto knife this right here. You know, I wish I had a more uh, therapeutic voice because I feel like we could start a YouTube channel and do like, you have the least therapeutic I have the least therapeutic voice. I, I think people hear my voice and they're just like, yeah, it's triggering and raging. So all we're doing here is just kind of getting these edges off, you know, and uh, you gotta be, you got you really do have to be somewhat delicate with this. Um, because the print is exposed on the bottom. Uh, one other thing for the, uh, just triggered me here, triggered my memory, I should say. Um, if you uh, have a client, you know, you can spray finish these, right? So there's chemicals uh, that you can spray on this that are matte finish that'll protect it. You know, the labs do it, they'll spray it, but you gotta have a little bit of a, either an outdoor space or in your garage uh, to do it and, um, and go from there. And so now, Right, we've got a print, and I didn't pull this up enough, um, but we've got a print that we can mount. Oop, let me come over here. Mount it on styrene, right? And then we can do things like stand by. Yeah, let me do this. I think I'm gonna sneak back over here. I think I think my team is booby trapping me. So now we can do things like take these blocks. I got these from um, photo flash drives. So they've got our logo here, they're magnetic. Uh, and then what this allows us to do is just kind of put it at the bottom. It's magnetic through the styrene. Oh. Hairspray. I can't imagine putting hairspray on there, but. Um, <laughs> It's not archival, that's right. Yeah, the hairspray is not archival. Um, so anyway, so now you can do stuff like that where they can display it that way. I've got them displayed on the shelf. You can do things like, um, take this down. Uh, you can do things like here where they're, um, let me show you this, right? Where they're, they're just put in mats, maybe. There you go. Uh, where these are on mats and then let me, let me show you one other thing. Like, so we're gonna talk about how I deliver these and present these to clients, but right, so stuff like this, um, right, we can, um, okay, stand by. We can now deliver to our clients, right, especially if you're like a boudoir photographer, I feel like this is an oppor a million dollar opportunity for you guys to self print. I don't know how you feel about it, but like this allows you to tell your clients, like your images never leave your studio. Your images are safe with us from, from shoot to edit to delivery. Um, but now you can deliver these boxes. These are also, uh, you can get them online, but we got these from photo flash drive. Uh, and then you can mat prints uh, and then put these prints in the box. You can get these things customized, laser inscribed here uh, for your clients. But this, you could print all of these 
And I'm telling you, your profit margins are pretty damn high uh, when, you go, when you print them yourselves for this type of project. To me, this is what makes sense. And I'm gonna highlight uh, in a second here you know, with, what to do and, and not do with this. So hopefully this is making sense and getting you at least excited to print and see that it's not hard. And to be able to bring this stuff to life, I think is just absolutely incredible. So other questions? Hmm, that's interesting. Said so they notice there's no print drying time. Is that not necessary with matte paper? We uh, typically, these things dry pretty quick. Um, you could probably make the argument that they shouldn't be face down uh, what, because it, it could scratch, it just hasn't cured enough. Um, but what we end up doing is it's very rare that I'm going from printer to mount. Usually when I'm doing this stuff, I'm printing three, four, five prints and they just kind of sit there and then maybe an hour later or something. So I don't, I don't work off of like start the clock, you know, like this is a chemical curing process. So you're probably right. It probably does need to sit. Uh, but as I'm looking at this, it's, it's fine. And if it does have to sit, I think it's less than 30 seconds. I'm, I'm really not 100% sure if somebody wants to look that up. Fact check me on that. <laughs> Give me a little fact check. Any other questions? Good, everybody having a good time? We're, we're enjoying this? We're gonna go, go out, buy printers, print, self-print? We're gonna do it? What is the cost of one print, for example, eight by 12? So the question is, what is the cost of one print? Um, there, if, can you send them to the link where we have that PDF where they can download it? We calculated this for you. Um, it's cheaper than you're paying. That I can tell you, uh, the exact amount, ink, paper, uh, everything else. I think something to keep in mind is while it may be cheaper per print, it's one, not why you should be doing it, that's my advice. Two, if you're like me, uh, I tend to print and then reprint and then reprint, so I think any money that I would have saved per se, I probably lost uh, because of that. So let's jump in here. I wanna be conscious of everybody's time. Got about another five, 10 minutes, I'm gonna give you links to the vendors that we use, the products and all that stuff. Um, uh, but I want to, right now is to me the meat of it. I want to, how do you, how do you do this for your clients? So bridal shows, any kind of shows or events, you want to control the look and feel of your booth, right? And you want the ability to refresh prints at will. It's very rare that I go to a show, uh, whether it's a bridal show or any kind of consumer event where we're setting up a booth that from show to show, I'm using the same prints. I'm constantly swapping out stuff. Now, in fairness, I'm not using the Canon Pro 1000, I'm using the Canon Pro 4000. If you're a studio, even a moderately sized studio, I would highly recommend you look at the Pro 4000. Uh, it, it's, it's gonna do a lot of stuff for you. So for shows for us, we do banners and we do 24 by 36 prints. We, are, we can print those. Um, it's a bigger, more expensive option, but the, the printer will pay for itself. So when we go to bridal shows, here's what our booth looks like, right? Pretty straightforward. Those pull-up banners on the, you see it where it says top uh, 10 wedding, uh, top wedding photographers 2018. Um, and then on the left, it's got my logo. Uh, those pull-up banners were printed by us in-house um, on the Canon Pro 4000. Every print in that booth was also printed by us and mounted using the same thing I just showed you guys uh, here where we're mounting it on styrene. All of that was done in-house. Uh, and now I have complete control over the way my booth looks. Now, to the person who was asking about price, I can tell you those prints were half the price had I bought it from a lab, any lab. So 24 by 36 styrene, um, and then the, uh, and I printed on matte paper, because I don't, uh, in trade shows, notice as you see this picture, if, you, if you're a wedding photographer, you've been to a trade show. And at those trade shows, they have the shittiest overhead light known to humans, right? I mean, it's just really bad. And in the past, I'd go there with like kind of uh, glossy paper and it just, it looks great in your studio and then you get it there and it just really looks bad. So now we just print on matte paper uh, and you're noticing as you're looking into the booth, there's no, there's no glare uh, on those prints. And that's why, because we're using that matte, uh, that matte paper. Uh, so keep, keep that in mind. But this gives me complete control over the look and feel of my booth. Uh, and I think there's something to be said for that. Uh, when you when you want that, but that's where the Pro 4000 comes into play. So the Pro 1000 
Uh, probably not the right printer for that. Uh, but not everybody wants to do this for their booth and all that other stuff. But if you have any level of volume, I want to say these prints, that's what I was trying to say, were half the price of buying it from a lab, right? So if you go to your lab and look up Styrene, deep matte print, 24 by 36, uh, off the top of my head, I don't know what it is, but the cost of Styrene, which I'll give you the vendor, uh, and uh, the paper and the printer and the ink, it's about half the price. So not only is it half the price, I have complete control. Uh, of this, right? So that might be, it's not for everybody, but some of you may want to consider the big, the big dog. Now here's where the Pro 1000, I think, just shines, right? Well, it, to me, th this is where the Pro 1000 becomes a no-brainer. And I hope when you hear this idea, you're like, son of a bitch, this is brilliant, right? So wedding vendor displays, probably one of the most underutilized opportunities here. Uh, and it amazes me to this day that photographers still don't do this. I run into obviously I'm an educator. I run into photographer after photographer after photographer is like, I can't get on my, my preferred vendor list. I can't get this venue. I can't get that venue. Well, what are you doing? Right? Meaning, what are you doing to win the business? Are you just sitting there like nagging the shit out of them? Like, hey, I want to be on your list. Well, congratulations. You and 10 other photographers, maybe even 50 other photographers want to be on that list. So what are you doing to get on that list other than nagging them? You are nobody to them, right? I don't mean that in you know, kind of an ass way. I, I just mean, you are truly no one. You're just somebody nagging them. Imagine if I called your studio and just said, I wanna be on your list. Who are you, right? So imagine now, right? All wedding venues have a space, right? They have a sales room and they love showing off their space. They love clients coming in. Clients don't necessarily book wedding venues sight unseen. They wanna walk the space. They wanna meet with the venue. They wanna do a tasting, all that other stuff. So they're gonna walk into a sales room. Why wouldn't your pictures be the ones that are in there? You ever think about that? So when I was starting out, I did this. This isn't some idea that I just made up. This is an idea founded in reality of me growing my own business. When I started here in the St. Louis area, I could not get a venue to let me in the door. And what I started doing was every wedding I shot, I would take the best picture of the venue, print it, walk it in on the Tuesday or Wednesday after the wedding. You're not doing that by sending it out to a lab, right? That's what I'm saying. Shoot it on Saturday, Sunday, just scroll through your, your, your shit, right? And be like, that's the one, that's the winning image. Edit it, print it, put your logo in the bottom corner, and then you deliver it like this. Salvatore Sincata, www.salsincata.com, right? And now you deliver this like this, right? Have your, your logo, your name here. You deliver it like this. You think that, that those salespeople aren't gonna put that up in their room? They absolutely are. Now you start doing this. Now do you think they're gonna return your phone call? Now do you think they're gonna to wanna to talk to you about being on their preferred vendor list when you're doing stuff for them? That's how it works, man. And so having a printer like this, where it doesn't, it's not costing me a whole lot of money to just go do this. All I've gotta do is book one wedding. This thing is paid for itself 10 times over. All I gotta do is book one wedding, right? So this is an idea you can walk off and do. So this is how you impress them. Client delivery, I was just talking about this. Boudoir clients, we're, we're heading into Valentine's Day, right? Not only does this give you privacy, right? So you're not sending nude images to, to, your, to your lab. You can assure your clients that you're always 100% in control of the images. That There's power in that. There's power in saying to your client, like, look, we are end to end here. We're gonna photograph your images, we're gonna edit your images, um, and we are gonna print your images, and they're, they're never leaving our studio. There's, there's power in that, to be able to say that to your clients. And there's power in delivering that print box, like I showed you. Now the print box I showed you, those were matted prints, like you see behind me here. Those are matted. You could easily mount them just like this. So just by the size mount, and now they're mounted. They'll look incredible. It just depends on what your client likes. Christmas, anniversary. Remember what I'm doing here. I'm giving you ideas on how to see this as more than just something that prints eight by tens. To me, this helps you make money. We deliver Christmas gifts for our clients every year. You can do the same. Th take it a step further. Imagine showing up at a wedding and you have a print like this that I just showed you mounted and displayed on the gift table. It could be a picture from their engagement session mounted on the gift table. What'd it cost you? N near nothing. 
Leave that there as a gift for them, right? Maybe it's printed on a paper where people can sign it, right? I mean, and now they have that. These are ways I'm trying to show you guys how to make incremental more money through self-printing, okay? You can do the same on their one-year anniversary. On their one-year anniversary, just pick a print, hand-printed, sign the print, deliver it. Uh, an, another idea, this is something we have done over and over for years, spec print. When your clients come in to see their, their prints, imagine them walking in the door and this is sitting there, right? I showed you my preview room. Imagine this is sitting there on the table for them to see. You can give it to them as a gift or you can offer it to them as an upgrade uh, if they buy into one of your larger packages, which is what we have been doing for years. Um, Hopefully this is making sense. So questions, hit, hit the girls in chat. I know there's always a delay in video. Uh, in the interim, I'm gonna start dropping in who our vendors are, right? So for the, for the, uh, yeah, hit me with the question. Uh, can I buy or change just one color in the printer or do you have to Oh, that's a great question. So can I buy or change one color in the printer or do I have to uh, change them all? No, they are individual ink cartridges. I don't wanna give you the wrong number, but for the Pro 1000, uh, they've got 12 color inks. They've got one for matte black and one for photo black. Uh, photo black. So, because the black is what you're going to go through the, the quickest uh, there. And then on the Pro 300, that's got 10 color inks, right? So, uh, but yes, you're replacing them individually for sure. Great question. Next. That's it. Perfect. All right. So, as we wrap up here, here's our vendors that we work with uh, Pacific Mount. Dot com. That's where we get our styrene from. That's this backer that I showed you. That's, uh, you can get your X-Acto knife there. You can get that anywhere. You can get it at a uh, you know, hobby store. But the cold press, the thing I was cranking to get out all the kind of air bubbles and make, make that thing flat, uh, that is also from Pacific Mount as well. Uh, lighting, we didn't really get into this, but behind me, um, what you're going to see is when a print comes off the printer, right, depending on your your studio lighting like here we've got everything's daylight controlled i mean we've got some kind of like kicker lights here uh but everything's daylight controlled but if you're in a, an environment where you've got fluorescent lights tungsten lights um mixed lighting it's gonna be very difficult to tell if your colors are right and so what most labs will do is they actually are in a dark room and this lighting here is those bulbs are daylight controlled i know it doesn't look that way because of the lighting in here um, and then you, we put our print under that to kind of double check that everything looks right, like the blacks look black. You know what I mean? Because if, if you're in a medium lit room, shadows can look like they're black, like they're all blocked up. And then you put it under the light and you realize, oh, well, no, it's not blocked up at all, right? Uh, and so, you know, here, this is getting the light here. So this is, you know, this is well lit. But if I were in a, a different kind of room, it might look like the shadows were all blocked up. So that becomes important. I don't think it's a must have. For me, I'm a little bit obsessive about the details. So there you go. Uh, and so that's from uh, gtilight.com. And here's some final thoughts. If you don't have any more questions, guys, I hope this was very valuable to you. Um, if you've enjoyed it, you know, and you wanna see more stuff like this, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, and um, you know, we do a lot of content like this, both photo shoots and business and all that kind of stuff for photographers. But final thoughts, world of photography is a very competitive market. That's not gonna change anytime soon, right? Everybody and their mother's a photographer. It's just how it works. And so I ask the same question all the time. How will you stand out? Uh, and if you don't know the answer to that question, that's probably a sign that you're not doing well in your business, right? So you've gotta look for ways to stand out. I think self-printing is a really simple way with all the shit we spend money on, to not be willing to spend, you know, 1200 bucks or even 900 bucks on the 300 to uh, print and be able to deliver this experience to your clients. I mean, I gave you three or four ideas that are no brainers to, to me. Um, seems silly. Uh, if you think about the cost of the printer compared to the value deliver, that's what I'm saying, this artisan mindset. So imagine having this for your clients when they arrive, right? Imagine delivering one of these to your clients around the holidays or uh, as an engagement gift or at the wedding uh, reception. Imagine printing your own box as a gift for your clients post-wedding even, right? Imagine, that's the point here. You've got to think outside the box to grow your business. So, any questions? Love it. Uh, would you go for the Pro 1000 or the Pro 300? 
So Kevin said, I've never done self printing. Uh, I want to print some of my landscape stuff and start selling that, you know, maybe, um, you know, either it's spec or he puts it on display in stores and stuff like that. Would I do the, uh, uh, the 300 or the 1000? I would make the extra investment and get the 1000 for that because that's going to allow you to go with some larger size uh, prints, right? That would be the thing that would drive me to the 1000, right? So it's only a couple extra, hundred bucks extra. Um, I would go with the Pro 1000 for that so that you have more versatility in how large or small, right? Because if you're selling your own landscape prints, you should be charging based on size, right? So if it's an eight by 10 or a 16 by 20, which you could print off this, it can go to 17 by 22, you're gonna charge more money. And when it comes to people displaying landscape in their homes, I'm gonna, you don't want them putting eight by tens up. You want them putting the larger uh, size, like think over the couch, right? Think on the mantle over the fireplace. That's gonna be that 1722 uh, size at a minimum. So great question. I hope, you, I hope you do it. I hope you invest in the printer and you start doing it. So that's cool. Anything else? Uh, the question is, have, have I ever printed out a Capture One? I have not. Uh, so I can't give you any firsthand experience or guidance. I'm gonna guess uh, that it's a similar process, but I'm, I'm definitely not sure because I've never printed uh, out of it. Okay, last question. Last question. Does the 1000 use roll paper? Uh, so the question is, does the 1000 use roll paper? The answer is no, uh, it's, gonna, it's sheet fed. Uh, so it's not gonna be able to run a roll through there. That's gonna be the 4000. Uh, so the 4,000, I believe, can do 24-inch rolls, uh, and then I believe it goes up to 48-inch rolls. Um, and, and, you know, we use a, we use a company called LexJet, uh, where you can buy rolls of paper. Uh, you can buy Canon paper, Hannah Mule paper uh, on a roll, or you could just buy kind of an off-brand. Uh, so, you know, that stuff matters, right? If I'm doing stuff for a bridal show coming off a roll, and I know it's only going to last one or two shows, I don't, I'm, I'm not really concerned about the quality of the paper. It just needs to look good. But if I'm delivering something to my client for their home, I want that high-end paper. So I'll spend a little bit more money on Canon or Hannah Mule, uh, right, to, to get that quality. And, it, and there is a difference in quality because with paper, a lot of the difference in quality is not only how the paper is receiving the ink, but it's also in how thick the paper is, right? So thinner paper is not gonna look or hold up ink the same as a thicker paper, but each has its place, right? So this is where, my advice to anybody who's watching this in the future and then is like, I'm in, I love this, I'm gonna pick up a printer. The first thing I would do with your printer before you commit to any paper is buy a uh, paper sample pack, right? And take one print, one image, and print it on every single piece of paper. Now, usually sample packs will come with like four of each type of paper, right? Okay, great. So pick a bright and airy picture, print it on all pieces of paper. Pick a, uh, pick a dark, moody image, and print it on all the different papers, right? See which is displaying blacks better, which is handling highlights better. And that'll start guiding you into like, here's the paper I really, really like. So great questions. Hopefully you guys have enjoyed this and picked up one, at least one piece of information. And if I've nudged any of you along uh, to wanting to start self printing, victory is mine. We'll see you in the next video.